and uh, it's my pleasure to share a special evening with you, a guided practice called Feeding Your Demons. So let's, uh, let's take a moment and take a few breaths and drop in and shift from our outer world to the inner world, the contemplative mode. A few moments of mindfulness of breathing to ground and center us in the moment together. Thank you. So tonight's format is a little different than usual. Normally we'll we begin right away with a, about a 30 minute sit uh, and then we give a Dharma talk and do Q&A. Tonight we will do it differently in the sense where I'll take a little bit of time to introduce the practice and then I will guide you through it and then we'll have time for discussion at the end. So um, some of you have done this before. I'll keep it relatively brief, but just enough so that the newer people can uh, feel, you know, that you've got a bit of an orientation before we dive into the practice. This is something that I have benefited from a lot over the years. I've shared it with people who I've witnessed uh, gain great benefit from it as well. So it's a real joy to share this practice. It might sound daunting, feeding your demons, but it's actually quite... Um, a nourishing and um, invigorating and can even be a fun practice. It's a meditation, but it's also a guided process. So it kind of hovers somewhere in between the two approaches. So I thought what, what would be helpful is to first give you just a little, a little smidgen of, of history of where the practice comes from, and then talk about uh, the basic structure of the practice, and then we'll, we'll dive in to actually doing it. If you like to journal at the end of uh, processes like this or meditation practices, um, you could even take a moment right now and grab your journal, notebook or pen and paper, whatever you like to do. And, um, and then because at the end of the process, I'll give you some time to practice to, to journal. So feeding your demons stems from a very uh, traditional um, tantric practice, tantric Buddhist practice that comes from Tibet, but actually stems from even the charnel ground practices of medieval India and tantric Indian practices, whether it's Hindu or Buddhist, oftentimes um, even the Buddha would say, would say things like go to um, the smashans, which is the Sanskrit word for charnel ground or cemetery, and practice meditation with death at the forefront of your awareness, not just as a mental idea, but as an actual living, not breathing um, phenomenon, you know, a burning corpse, meditate on impermanence in that way. So moving into that which we would normally move out of or move away from is a common theme in contemplative practices as a way to kind of loosen up our fixation and our even like get us out of the rut of our normal life so that we find inspiration we we move into the frightening places so that we can then build our strength and fortitude and understand fear on a deeper level because fear really does uh, rule a lot of our our life when we really start to think about fear I'm not even talking about the big fear of fear of death or fear of being injured or hurt, but also fear of failure, fear of losing love, fear of losing a loved one, um, 
fear of not being good enough, fear, 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 you know, it's fear can be very surreptitious and live beneath the surface within us in a lot of ways. And so going to places that scare us, that's a very popular um, title by Pema Chodron. You might've read the book called, um, uh, what is it? Places that scare you, or I can't remember exactly what it's called, but uh, is an important part of spiritual practice, not just Buddhism, but universal. So this feeding your demons practice stems from uh, Chud, which is spelled C-H-O with an umlaut, D, Chud. And, and that's a Tibetan word that means to sever or severance. And the Sanskrit word for that is Chedana, Chedana. And so it stems from Indian practices, but really flourished in Tibet uh, through the teachings of the 11th century yogini, a woman teacher named Machig Labdran. Machig Labdran. Maybe, Pam, could you type that in? People might want to have a spelling of some of these words. Machig Labdran, she founded this practice called Chud, which means severance or to cut through. And essentially what we're doing is cutting through ego fixation. We're not, you know cutting others or cutting ourselves we are cutting through that fixation that glue that keeps us bound in samsara bound into the sense of separate self or the small self rather than uh feeling interconnected feeling the unity of of our existence and so on so machig lavran in the 11th century adapted her teachings based on the sutras based on classic teachings as well as shamanic practices indigenous to Tibet that come from the Bun. The Bun tradition was the shamanic or the pre-existing, one of the pre-existing uh, prominent religious traditions in Tibet before Buddhism came and really took root in the 8th century CE. And so Machiglavran combined the shamanic practices that pre-existed Buddhism with Buddhist teachings and created her own uh, tradition that became so popular in Tibet that it infiltrated all the main schools of Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. You find Chud practice in the Gelugpa, which is the Dalai Lama's lineage. You find it in the Sakyapa, in the Nyingmapa, and the Kagyupa. All these four lineages in, absorbed her teachings and developed their own unique expressions of it. It's a very beautiful and interesting tradi tradition to study and really the only one of its kind. I mean, there, there's another tradition, another practice tradition founded by a woman, a uh, contemporary of Machi Glavdran called Nyungne. It's a fasting and purifying practice. So that's another example of a practice that kind of spread out into all the different um, lineages. There are many like that, like the Tonglen and so on. So the Chud practice is done with a, a shamanic style drum, a larger drum than what was coming from India. These Indian drums were smaller little Damaru drums, whereas the Chud drum takes after the Siberian shamanic drum. It's a larger face, uh, rounder, and can fit like right under the crook of the arm you know that's how you measure your chud drum is you find the right fit uh fits right within the crook of your arm between the arm and the waist and the the practice is played with the drum the double-sided drum called the chud damaru or chud dam and with a bell held in the left hand the drum is in the right and the bell is in the left and then the melodies the chants and practices, the visualizations, and so on, are sung in a haunting melody, beautiful melodies. And again, there are many different Chud traditions. There's not just one. And so my teacher, Lama Tsultrim Alioni, you know, from now we're fast forwarding to the 20th century in the 1980s, she began to teach it. She studied with uh, her teacher, Namkai Norbu Rinpoche, a very uh, wonderful, important Dzogchen teacher who was really the first to teach Dzogchen, the great perfection in the West, as well as the Chud practice. It hadn't really been taught yet. And he had a dream. And in the dream, he dreamed a, a Chud that was a condensation of a couple different Chud practices. It was very concise. And in the dream, Westerners, 
hundreds of Westerners were doing it with him. So he took that as a sign to begin teaching. And so he began teaching the Chud in the 1980s. And Lama Tsultram was one of his primary students who received that, started practicing it, and then eventually began teaching it after many years. And what she said is that she found that even though the practice was very transformative and healing, it was foreign, you know, it's chanted in Tibetan language and done with these, you know, exotic instruments uh, for Westerners. She felt that herself and others might not be really getting the, the uh, transformative benefits of that practice. And so she adapted it to what we know today as feeding your demons, where she took the primary aspects of the chud, the severance practice, and then combined it with modern day techniques of therapy, namely that of gestalt therapy, empty chair therapy, where you actually dialogue with fragmented aspects of yourself, right? In order to heal, integrate, gain wisdom, insight. And so this is what what became Feeding Your Demons. She jokes and says it's like chud in Western clothing. <laughs> and it really is transformative. We have done, Eve, Eve and I helped to design the first ever study, community-based uh, pilot study for Feeding Your Demons back in 2018, pre, <laughs> pre-COVID, PC. <laughs> And uh, we did it against the stream, which became SFDC, of course. Uh, And we had amazing results. Uh, I have them written down right here, just a couple of things. The people, we had a control group who did uh, 15 sessions of Feeding Your Demons over 30 days. 61 people were recruited. And the results were that um, Feeding Your Demons was associated with a greater decrease in stress symptoms, increase in self-compassion, increase in emotion awareness and self-regulation. And with greater numbers of sessions, the more times you practice, some people didn't fulfill all the 15 times and others did. And those that did, they had even more increases in self-compassion and satisfaction with life as well. Also, a decrease in depression and intolerance for uncertainty. And it might be intolerance for uncertainty. That was such an interesting indicator that the the, uh, Philippe Goldin and Eve thought was an important aspect to bring into the study. And Philippe was fascinated by that, the fact that that, um, decrease in depression, but intolerance for uncertainty was... um, was minimized, meaning people could tolerate uncertainty better with more sessions, with sessions in Feeding Your Demons. And he thought that perhaps that might be because we are learning to move towards that which we would normally move away from, like in the Tonglen, right? So we go towards it, we learn from it, we heal it, and then we build fortitude, we get stronger because of that. And that helps people tolerate uncertainty in life. So... Very interesting. This study is uh, in peer review, and it should be published pretty soon, I hope. Uh, Eve, also, we have two papers on coming out on this study. One is uh, quantitative, which is the one that Philippe Goldin wrote, and then qualitative is the one that uh, Eve wrote with a team of wonderful scholars and and scientists as well, and I helped edit those. So uh, feeding your demons. So what are demons? Demons are not gargoyles and frightening uh, spirits living in your basement. (laughs) They are those things that block our experience of freedom. It's really anything in your life that is more on an internal, you know, spiritual or psychological mental level that blocks your experience of freedom that runs and runs round and round like thoughts, anxieties, hopes, and fears. Um, And so this is rooted back in the sutra teachings of the Buddha, the Prajnaparamita sutras, the uh, perfection of wisdom sutras, and that were very influential to Machiglavdran. And in these sutras, they say, you know, demons are not outside of you. They are a product of your own mind. And it was that 
stanza was that passage that addressed demons that caused Machi Glaburn to have an epiphany and develop her own um, teachings on Chud. And so that continues to this approach where, yeah, we say feeding your demons. It's a pretty um, intense phrase. People often say, I don't want to feed my demon. If I feed my demon uh, or my demons, won't they get stronger? And that is the knee-jerk reaction. That's the assumption. But actually, if you, if you really look at your life, you might find, as the, the old saying says, that which we resist persists. Uh, if we try to starve the demons, they actually kind of get bloated and have an unwieldy, more unconscious kind of power over our life. But if we can sit, stop and turn and dialogue with it, learn from it, ask it, what do you really need? <laughs> you know, what do you need to say? And then, and then hear it and offer it that deeper need that it really has then it can heal, it can become integrated. So that's this, this technique will help us do that. And so demons, they can be uh, addictions, they can be hope and fear, you know, hoping for, you know, the perfect mate, that can be a demon within us, right? Because it can keep us from perhaps feeling satisfied in the moment, or satisfied with who is sitting right in front of us, because we always think, oh, maybe there's something better. Uh, so hope can actually be a demon. In her teaching, she actually calls hopes gods. So gods and demons are just hopes and fears. So the demons are the fears, and the gods are the hopes. Now, there's nothing wrong with hope, and there's nothing wrong with fear. Sometimes it can save our life. But when it, when they, you know, more on a psychological level, when we're looping around in these states, that's when it can become problematic. So if you have an addiction to a substance or a behavior, that can be something that you bring to this practice. Okay, I'm, tonight I'm going to feed my cigarette addiction demon. Or it might be something like my heartbreak uh, demon. Maybe you've been betrayed and your heart's broken. Uh, maybe there's depression living in you. Or maybe it's been around for a long time and you just can't shake it you can work that in this practice. It can be something that's really up for you right now. You know, often that's what Lama Tsultram says when you're trying to figure out, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to feed tonight? <laughs> you know, think about, well, what's, what's kind of prickly? What's at the surface? What did I, what did I feel through the day that might have just not sat well with me? Did I have conflict at work or in my family? Uh, did someone say something that bothered me? What's important to understand is that it's not the, if you're working with a relationship demon, it's not the person. <laughs> the person is not the demon or the God. Okay. It's the, the way you feel around that dynamic with that person that's the demon. So for example, maybe I have a partner who is flirtatious with other people and it makes me jealous. So I could feed that feeling of jealousy within me. He or she is not the actual demon, right? So maybe you're mad at your ex. Believe it or not, they are not the demon. <laughs> it's your anger that we work that you work with in this process because it's a very personal somatic based process we really try to drop out of the story oh they did me wrong or i should feel this way whatever drop it as much as possible drop out of the mental storyline and drop into the body and then the process unfolds in a, in a very deep way when we can do that and so um, the, just one thing about the process, and then I'll share a couple quotes, and then we'll do it. And don't worry if you don't know what you're going to work with. I actually give you some time in the process itself at the very beginning to really feel into what you want to work with tonight. You might have a bunch of demons lining up, me, me, me. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to say, pick one. Because if you try to, sometimes people at the end of a process will say, well, I had a few, so I just thought I would line them up and do that. That's, but then they get confused and no wonder they got derailed in the process and didn't feel like it might have worked for them. They need, you need to choose one and then just tell the other ones, look, I'll, I'll 
I'll attend to you next time. <laughs> so, and at a certain point, I'll have you ask the demon some questions. There are three questions we ask the demon. The first is, what do you want? The second is, what do you really need? Meaning, what is the need beneath the want? And then the third question is, how will you feel when you get what you really need? So again, you don't have to remember any of this, but I want you to understand the logic behind it. The first question is kind of getting more at the superficial thing. Like, what do you want? Like, okay, if I'm feeding my cigarette demon, then the demon, then, then the answer would be, I want a cigarette. So that more of that superfit, the, the initial surface want. And then the second question is getting beneath that, the underbelly of it. Well, what do you really need? Well, maybe I really need to feel um, satisfied or satiated. So that's the need beneath the initial want. And then how will you feel when you get what you really need? Well, if I feel, not if I get what I really want, that's the cigarette, right? But when I get what I really need, the answer was, to that was satisfaction or satiation. So if I get satiated or sad, if I feel satisfied, then the way I'd feel when I get what I really need would be um, calm or content or whole. So that's the logic of those three questions. So you don't have to know what the demon's going to say. You're actually going to switch positions and become the demon and answer from the demon's point of view. Likewise, when you meet the ally towards the end, which is another very cool moment, then you'll also get to speak as the ally, switching positions in this gestalt-based open chair, empty chair technique. Okay. So Rilke is one of my favorite poets, and he had a natural... Um, a approach that that very much aligns with feeding your demons and one of the two of the quotes that i love from him address this work really explicitly he said this is rilke rainier rilke from his book letters to a young poet perhaps everything terrible in its deepest being is something helpless that wants help from us Perhaps everything terrible is in its deepest being something helpless that wants help from us. And so we often, you know, we think, oh, well, I don't like my demons. I don't want to get close to them. I don't even want to become my demon. I don't want to feed it. But really, if we understand that perhaps these so-called terrible demons, these frightening energies within us or dynamics that we carry or feel is actually quite helpless and it needs us it needs our attention needs our love and then he says our fears are like dragons guarding our deepest treasures and so demons are like that you know they're rawr, they're, they're, they're big and spiky and scary but then once we get to know them or we pet them or we give them some nectar we feed them to complete satisfaction then we realize that beneath them, what they were really doing was guarding something very beautiful and precious and our greatest gems, right? Our wisdom, our tenderness, our insight, our truth. And then a quote from Carl Jung, we will become our opposite if we do not learn to accommodate the opposite within us. And so this is what we're doing with feeding your demons so that they don't take over us and co-opt our lives. We learn to accommodate. We learn to learn from, to listen to, to make room for these so-called opposites within us. So say we're, we're, an, we're angry, but we don't want to be angry. I don't like my angry part. Well, if we can create some space to accommodate that and learn from it, then it won't overpower us anymore. We actually, it becomes an ally, it becomes a friend. It becomes a creative energy that we can channel in our life. Okay. 
So how does that sound? You ready? Okay, good. So before I have you close your eyes, you're going to keep your eyes closed for the process. It takes about 30 minutes. Of course, if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes completely, you can just have them a little, you know, slightly open. The main point is to be inward because you're going to be having imagery arise. And I want to invite you to really trust the imagery that comes up. Jung also said that the imagery is a subconscious, it's, it's language. The language of the subconscious is imagery. So trust it, even if some weird imagery comes up that you're like, oh, that couldn't be it. Just trust it because it will reveal itself why it came. So the eyes closed can help that imagery come up and not and help you not be distracted. If you want a journal at the end, you can get that right now and put it to, to your side. And then what you're going to do is have an empty space or chair or cushion in front of you, because at a certain point, I'll have you switch positions. And you'll want to be able to switch positions in a way where you don't have to open your eyes to check where's the chair. <laughs> you want it within hand's reach so you can sidle over and switch positions, keeping the eyes closed as much as possible. So what I like to say, you know, when I'm doing like, say I'm doing it with a client on Zoom, uh, I would have them have their profile to me. And then when they switch positions, they'll get up and then, you know, sit like that. You don't have to do that. You can turn your camera off. You don't have to be on camera. Uh, but that's one way to do it. Just position yourself that, so you have an empty cushion, seat, blanket, folded up a nice space uh, to have your demon and then your ally feel welcome <laughs> when it's time to change positions, okay? And then you're just going to follow, follow my words. So you don't have to remember anything that I just said. It's all about your inner, inner journey now. You're going on a, on a journey. So in in the times of COVID, this has been a really great resource because we might not always be able to go out in our journeys, but we can go in to the inner dimensions, which are very vast and rich. So turn your notifications off, close your door, tell your family you're going to drop in to a deep meditative space so they should leave you alone. <laughs> The least amount of distraction, the better, the deeper the practice will be for you. Okay, so now once you're settled, allow your eyes to close and keep them closed as much as possible until the end of the process. Or slightly hooded is fine. And we begin with some relaxation breaths. So breathing through your nose or mouth, whatever is comfortable for you. We'll take a few breaths, the first three breaths, breathing into any physical tension in your body. Let the in-breath fill the body and caress any areas of tension in the body and release that tension with the out-breath. Feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. With your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension you're holding. Notice where you're holding emotional tension in your body. And then hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. Feel it melting down into the earth beneath you. And then for the last three breaths, breathe into any mental tension or worries you're holding. Notice where you're holding mental tension in your body. And then hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. Feel it melting down, down into the earth beneath you.
Now generate a heartfelt motivation for your practice. Now the first step of feeding your demons is to take a moment and really feel into what you'd like to work with tonight. What feels close to the surface? What's up for you now? Really anything that blocks your experience of freedom, of expression, of creativity, of joy, contentment. Once you've landed on the, the demon you'd like to work with tonight, then feel it in your body. Where does it live most strongly in your body right now? In the head, the heart, the back, the belly. Where do you hold this energy, this demon most strongly in your body? Notice what is its shape? What is its color? What is its texture? What is its temperature? Is it hot, cold, warm, neutral?
because it's density. Is it dense or ethereal, light or heavy? Now intensify this feeling for a moment, perhaps remembering when you felt it last most strongly, just for a moment, intensify it. Now allow this sensation, the color, texture, and temperature, and so on, and allow this feeling to move out of your body and become personified in front of you with a being, as a being with limbs, a face, eyes, and so on. Imagine that it leaves your body and then becomes personified as a being in front of you. It can help to make a gesture with your hands to move the energy out of the body if you like. And notice what you see. What is its size? Color. What is the surface of its body like? Density. Does it have a gender? What is its character? Emotional state. What is the look in its eyes? Now notice something about this being that you haven't seen before. Notice something new. What else?
Now you're going to ask this demon the following questions, repeating out loud after me, not waiting for the answer because you'll switch positions and answer as the demon in a moment. What do you want? What do you really need? How will you feel when you get what you really need? So now switching positions, becoming the demon, keeping the eyes closed as much as possible as you transition into the empty seat or space in front of you. And take a moment to settle into the demon's body and feel what it's like to be the demon. Feel free to make a gesture, an expression, a position that helps you embody the energy of the demon. Notice how it feels to be in the demon's body. Notice how your normal self looks from the demon's point of view. Now answering these questions, speaking as the demon. So you are speaking as the demon here. Finishing this each phrase with a complete sentence, I'll offer you the first part and you can complete it. Speaking as the demon. What I want is... What I really need is When I get what I really need, I will feel.
Take note of the answer of this last question. What is the feeling the demon would have when it gets what it really needs? Take note of the feeling. And when you're ready, return to your original seat. Take a moment to settle back into your own body. And see the demon opposite you. And now imagine that you dissolve your body into nectar. And this nectar has the quality of the feeling the demon would have when it gets what it really needs. The answer to the third question. Or you can imagine that you're creating an infinite supply of nectar, unlimited, magically creating it. It's up to you. So either dissolve your body, which is more of that shamanic chud element of dissolving the physical form and it transforms into nectar and it's that nectar that we feed the demon. Or if that's not something you want to do, just imagine that you create an infinite supply of nectar and feed the demon this nectar till complete satisfaction is reached. Notice how it takes it in. Is it liquid? Is it a mist? Is it light? Is it food? Feed this nectar that is that feeling that it would have when it got what it really deeply needed. Feed it to complete satisfaction, unlimited supply flowing from you to the demon. But as if it shapeshifts, changes as it takes in the nectar. Notice the color of the nectar. Getting to complete satisfaction and notice how the demon looks now.
doesn't even feel insatiable and imagined now what it would look like if it were completely satisfied. How would it look if it were completely satisfied? I'll notice if there's a being present after the demon is completely satisfied. And if there is a being in place of the demon, then ask it if it is the ally. If there is no being present, then invite an ally to appear. Or if it says, no, I'm not your ally, also invite the ally to appear. Inviting the ally to appear and notice what you see. You know as your ally when they say, yes, I'm your ally, or they feel benevolent. This is a, an energy that is on your side, not combative, not resisting. So invite the ally to appear. If you need to, again, invite the ally and notice what you see. Notice its size. Color. Notice the surface of its body. Density. that have a gender. What is its character? emotional state. Notice the look in its eyes. Now notice something about the ally that you didn't see before.
you really feel connected with the energy of the ally, ask these questions. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What pledge do you make to me? And how can I access you? Having asked the questions, now change places and become the ally. Take a moment to settle into the ally's body. Feel free to take a gesture, a position, an expression that helps you embody the energy of the ally. Notice how it feels to be in the ally's body now. Notice how your normal self looks from the ally's point of view. When you're ready, answer the questions, speaking as the ally. I'll say the beginning and you can complete in a full sentence, speaking as the ally now. I will help you by. I will protect you by. I pledge I will. You can access me by. When you're ready, return to your original seat. Take a moment to settle back into your own body and feel the ally opposite you again. See the ally opposite you again.
bringing the ally in front of you and look into its eyes and feel its energy pouring into your body. Coming all the way through your body, it spreads all the way down to the soles of your feet, your fingertips and throughout your whole body. This benevolent energy, protective energy of the ally loving energy flowing into you. Now imagine that the ally dissolves into radiant light. Notice the color of the light. And feel this light dissolving into you, integrating this luminosity into every cell of your body. Take note of the feeling of the energy of the ally in your body. Now you, along with the integrated energy of the ally, dissolve into spacious, open awareness. Dissolving into this open sense of unlimited, vast space and resting in that state. Allow yourself to just rest.
Now slowly let's begin to come back, gradually coming back to your body. Feel the breath in the body, texture of the clothes against your skin. Gradually coming back and recalling the feeling of the energy of the ally in your body while you come back. And then now as you open your eyes, maintain the feeling of the energy of the ally in your body. Look around your room if you want. And then take your journal, piece of paper and pen and spend some time free writing any memories of what came through you, what the demon said, what the ally said, the imagery, whatever you like now. Feel, take about a few minutes here to, to journal, and then we'll come back as a group.
few more minutes. Okay, so let's come back. So in our last 10 minutes, I'd love to open it up for any questions, comments, observations, uh, any shares. Um, sometimes it's nice to hear the imagery that came up for you or the message of the ally or the demon. I'm going to sneeze. Hold on a sec. I'm just getting over COVID. I had it for 10 days. My day 10, it was pretty mild, but the sneeze, sneezes were prominent. <laughs> oh, I just saw a chat come in. What did it say? Okay, great. Good, Cole. Thank you. Well, feel free to chat things in if you'd prefer, or you can unmute yourself and, and speak. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you. Lemon is wants wants to feel the emptiness. My stomach, all the organs inside my belly are being calm and free, and getting some light. A big dog, curly hair, sitting close to me. My mind relaxes. My brain is free of my tension. So it's swimming in the clear water inside my head. My dog, the brown dog, sits on my side. I'm full of fresh air. A white horse dances around me. A Spanish horse. Oh, that's lovely. I love the po poetic nature of that. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes, please.
Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Chandra. It was beautiful. I've done this practice before, and this is the first time. I think I've done it maybe five times um, at the most. Before I had met you, something, it was, something so strange happened to me because this book by your teacher, Feeding Your Demons, came to me in Mexico many years ago. And I tried doing the practices out of the book several times, not with much success, because I was very afraid of doing it by myself. And then I met you years later when I came here to the States. And I started, you know, and I've done this practice with you sometimes. But this time, uh, for the first time, because I was always, uh, I think, I, I don't know why, but this time it just like really transported me in a, in a, in a very strange way. I felt for the first time I was able to visualize, especially the ally, that the ally, ally that, was, that was always, that was always something that I could never, it, it never came up before. And this time, uh, that made a, a huge difference, huge, huge difference, because for the first time I felt the whole arc of the, of the thing, like it, I, it, it really transformed the energy for me. And the ally was so, um, it just gave me, you know, it just like broke me up like in pieces. Like just like, I felt like so much energy suddenly and very, um, just beautiful. Just it, it just took all away all the fear that I had before. It was incredible, beautiful. Thank you. Yes, yeah, stick with it. See, <laughs> you can be like her too. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> what a great story too. I'm so happy. So happy. Yeah. Thank you. shy you don't have to share like all the details so you know it's the way that uh, both sylvia and gina just shared you know you can keep it kind of high level but how it affected you if you don't feel like sharing the details too it's nice to hear you can share whatever you want And if, if, you know, nobody wants to share, that's okay too. No pressure, of course. I can, um, I can riff off of the theme. I hope that, um, I hope that the, I wonder how the feeding felt. Is somebody unmuting? I'm wondering how the feeding felt. You know, normally we fight. So the one liner is feed, not fight. Right, it's feed not fight the demon. So how did it feel to feed it when your instinct might have initially been like, no, but I'll do it anyway because this is supposed to work. Um, curious about that. I can share about that. Um, I, it was really interesting. Um, I've done this practice before and had a very distinct demon and a very distinct ally. And today the demon transformed into the ally through the process of feeding. Yeah. Um, and so what I wrote down was, and like the demon that I was working with is like the demon of social media addiction and like phone energy suck. Um, so Wait, who's the demon- talking? I can't see, are you not? It's, Why? it's Olivia, my camera is not That's okay. On. I can't even tell, like usually the, the box is highlight, highlighted so I can at least see the name, but anyway, I can't, yeah. that's it's okay. Olivia. Olivia? Um, oh, hi. Okay. Hi. For some reason you're not, um, uh, high, high um, lit. <laughs> I'm, I'm, if I, even if I'm not lit, can you still hear me talk? I can hear you. Great. Keep going. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Hun. <laughs> okay. So the demon of social media addiction is a dark, agitated, unstable, cold, ephemeral, yet dense demon. 
He sources his power from hooks in my core and blankets me in, a in an immobilizing darkness while fe feeding off the speed and frenetic movement of my mind. When fed, he turned into a warm, glowing, golden pink being who is stable yet floating, grounded and warm, loving and present. This ally returns power to the bridge between my core and heart and is fed and fueled by an endless source of pure love. What an image. Thank you. Thank you. The bridge. The bridge to your core, right? Is that what you said? The bridge. It's between core and heart. Like the image of the demon was like very heavy on like my back and shoulders. And then as I was feeding that demon, it like transformed into this like pudgy, delightful, like globulous <laughs> golden pink image that then like shrank down into a very like compact, dense pocket of light that then like placed itself like in the space between like my heart and like my core and it felt like a, a reconnection of that energy whereas like the demon felt like it was hooked in and like sucking and depleting energy from that part of my body so that's pretty cool so thank you for ah. wonderful golden pink <laughs> And I see Paul the second time doing this practice, and it was much easier to meet the demon and ally. Uh-huh, good. Very good. Well, thank you all. We are at time, so I appreciate you and your practice and your presence here and all of us. Um, I hope you, your demons became your allies. <laughs> and so I try to offer this every maybe six weeks or so in this Wednesday night class. And next week, we'll go back to our book study, which is called On the Path to Enlightenment, Heart Advice from the Great Tibetan Masters. It's edited, consolidated by um, Matthew Ricard. Beautiful, beautiful text. So we'll continue on with that one. So wishing you well. Eve will be with you next week, and then I'll come the following week, and so on. We'll leapfrog for a while like that. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Pam, for hosting. Thank you all. Be Thank well. You, Take Aaron. care. I'm glad you're Thank feeling you better, so Chandra. Much. Yeah. Thanks, Chandra. You're welcome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.